here you go. Kids ready, and then we'll get going. No. Okay. Hey, what? you just lay out their clothes because it takes me five minutes. Honey, That's perfect. Seriously. Jack, well, we're already late for church. Hey, you Brian. Go get yourself dressed. Did you pick up my stuff from the dry cleaners? Uh, ooh. I'm gonna make you waffles. Can I have a sandwich? Yes, but you gotta make it by yourself. Jack! Okay. This is all I could find and the zipper's broken. Alright, I'll go grab a safety pin. I got the high score! <sighs> That's great, sweetie, but go get dressed. I need you to stay still, okay? Honey. Anna! Come on, let's go! Okay. Everybody needs to eat. Here you go. I need one. Here you go. Okay, here you go. I here forgot you. my shoes. Oh. Honey, we gotta go no. back. I wanna take off my shoes. Nobody's taking off their shoes. And I want everybody to understand that we're oh. gonna go <laughs> We made it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, how many come from that home this morning? Anybody? I love it. You know, you all come here on Sunday morning, and you all look amazing, and we, the pastoral staff, have no idea what you went through just to get here on Sunday morning, but we're so glad that you're here, and uh, I don't know what background you come from, but we, we just want you to know that there are no normal families. Are you with me on that one? I just want to drill that into you. There are no normal families, and uh, if you do find a normal family, it ain't normal. There just are no normal families. And so we're going to take a few weeks and just talk about family a little bit. Um, how many of you have a family? Raise your hand. Okay, how many have ever had a family? Raise your hand. Um, how many know a family? Raise your hand. How many have ever envied the other family? Raise your hand. How many wish you had a different family? Raise your hand. Anybody? Yeah, that's, that's kind of, and you know the amazing thing about family is you don't get to pick your family. All you get is what the doctor brought home to you or what your parents present to you. That's, that's kind of what you get, and uh, that, that's family. And, and so when we even talk about family, it just brings up all these different ideas and connotations and thoughts in our mind. And uh, yeah, family. Comedian George Burns, I love what he said about family. He said, happiness, happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. That's kind of what he went with that whole thing. So we talk about family. Some of you have amazing memories about family. You can go back to holidays and holiday events and just great memories and you remember the house and the tree and the yard and all that kind of stuff. Others of you, obviously, family brings up all kinds of negative thoughts and kind of bad stuff in your mind. So we, we just want to take a little bit to talk about family. And, and nobody, nobody, uh, come on, just nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors. Would you agree with me on that one? 
But sometimes we'd like to, wouldn't we? I mean, when we get to know people and we see their children and hang out with them, we, we would just kind of like to know what goes on behind closed doors. And as a pastor, I, I would love to share with you some passage in the Bible that uh, we could just open up and read the example of this family. And like, they were an amazing family. And we should live like this family and point to it. But yet, when we look at families in the Bible, I know, I know that families aren't normal. We start all the way back at the beginning of the Bible. We, we've maybe heard a story about Cain and Abel. There's Adam and Eve. They had a couple of boys, Cain and Abel. Cain kills his brother. Like, what do you take away from that? Just other than you might feel like killing your brother, but don't kill your brother. I mean, that whole kind of thing. So, uh, And then a few chapters later in the same book, there's a guy named Lot, and he's got this thing with his two daughters. I'm not even going to tell you about that because it's just, ooh, all the way through the story. So you can read that on your own. And then later on in the Bible, there's a guy named Moses, a really popular guy. Moses, his sister Miriam didn't like the chick that he married, and so there was that whole thing going on. And then Jacob, he comes on a little bit later. Jacob cheats his brother to get the inheritance. And then we've got King David. He's a really popular figure in the Bible. King David has this thing with Bathsheba, a woman he wasn't even married to. Like that whole thing goes on. And then David's son by one wife. I mean, David got more than one wife. Talk about abnormal families. His son by one wife rapes his sister, the daughter of another wife in that whole family. And then you get to the New Testament, you think, well, Jesus' family, they would have it all together. I mean, Jesus was the firstborn, and then Mary and Joseph had other children after that whole kind of thing. His own brothers and sisters didn't believe that he was the Messiah. I mean, come on. If you told your family that you were the Messiah, they'd take you to a hospital for that, right? So there are no normal families, even in the Bible. But there are some really great principles in the Word of God that we can share from. And I want to share some of those principles with you today. I, it doesn't matter if you're single, it doesn't matter if you're married, it doesn't matter if you're younger, older, maybe even not a, a professing follower of Jesus. I just think there's some principles that we can find in God's Word that might help us, help us in our family situations. And again, there are no normal, ideal families. And some, on Sunday morning, come on, come on. I, I, as, a, as a pastor, you kind of get to know stuff. And you get to know people. And, and I interact with people on different levels and different opportunities than you do. And here's, I think, the lie that we can believe. When we come to church on Sunday morning, we look at the other families in church and go, man, you know, they probably got up and worshiped God and had devotions this morning. His children probably, all three kids probably sing melodies and harmonies, and they probably sang, and they were at the breakfast table holding hands, praying together. Just look at them, and they're going to go home today. It's going to be Jesus all over that home. They don't have any financial problems. They don't have any health problems. Everything just seems to work for them. Let me just tell you as a pastor, I know way different than that, all right? I just, I just know there are no families like that at Life Church, and uh, if there are families like that at Life Church, they got other stuff going on. Just saying, all right. So anyway, um, so there's some principles I'm going to share with you today, and instead of being real preachy, because sometimes I kind of get preachy up here, I'm going to be more of a teacher to you. In fact, there's going to be times when I share the message today that I'm going to talk to you a little bit like a dad. So... Um, if you want to find a book in the Bible, it's, it's, a, it's a letter that a guy named Paul writes, and he writes this letter to a church in the city of Ephesus, and that becomes then the name for the book that we're going to read from, Ephesians. It's in the New Testament part of your Bible. If you've got to use an index or search or whatever it is, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5 and read some verses there. And I think there's some great principles. You've probably heard these before, but let's see if we can apply them to where we live today, right here in this world. In Ephesians chapter 5 is where we're going to start, and I just want you to know again that there are no normal families. There are no normal families. There's an ideal family, and then there's a real family. There's everybody else's family, and then there's your family. And sometimes, here's what goes on. Between the ideal and the real, there's a gap in the middle. And sometimes we try to fill the gap in the middle because we want to personify an image. That when we go out into the public, when we take our kids to Walmart, we go to church on a Sunday morning, when we drop them off at the school on Monday morning, there's a certain persona or an image we want people to believe about us. And the problem with that is sometimes when we try to fill the gap with things that aren't real about us, we start living a lie. And so I want to I share with you some principles that I think will help fill that gap a little bit. And you can just kind of rest assured that there is no such thing as a normal family. And everybody in here, when I say there's no such thing as a normal family, you can all go, 
<sighs> Thank you, Pastor. All right, I just want to give you that relief. So in Ephesians chapter 5, the first thing that Paul says, and I think this is a great application to family, look what he says in chapter 5, verse number 1. Huge statement. Imitate God in everything you do. Now, I could just pause right there and say this isn't just for family. This is for everybody all the time everywhere. What a huge order that is. He says, look, imitate God in everything you do because you are his dear children. Now, I'm going I'm to make an assumption here that the people I'm talking to, and maybe you're watching us online, that Paul is writing to a church. He's not writing to people outside of the church. He's writing to people who profess to be followers of Jesus, all right? So if you're a follower of Jesus, he says the same mandate. He says, imitate God in everything you do. Now just imagine this for just a moment. Think about your own family life. What if your parents lived out their lives in front of your life, imitating God more often than they did? Understand the character of God. God is patient. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in loving kindness. He's just. He's merciful. He's full of grace. He didn't hang out at the bar at night. He didn't abandon his family. In fact, he sends his son into the world to build relationship because he loves spending time with his creation. Now imagine if your parents would do all of that stuff for you because you've got stories about your parents. And I know that you want to be a great parent if you're a parent in here today. You want to be a great parent to your, your children. And so just, if we would apply that one principle, if we could just imitate God in everything that we do, in our attitude, our speech, our conduct, our behavior, all of that kind of stuff. And then it kind of builds on that in the next verse. Look what he says in, in verse number two. Live a life filled with love. Here's what I mean by that. Following the example of Christ, and we're going to build on that a little bit later, and here's what Jesus did for us. He loved us and he offered himself as a sacrifice to us. Jesus never leveraged his power. Like if he was at church today and we we're going to have a meal afterwards, he would have never said, you know what, since I'm Jesus, let me be first in line. Hey, you in the coffee line out there? Hey, I'm Jesus. Hello. You know, he never did that. Instead, Jesus offered himself. He always sacrificed himself. He put others first because in a family, in a family, you understand that a family is not about the individual. It's about the family. Whatever the family might be, if you're a single parent today, if you're married, if you're blended, whatever the case is, Robin and I both come from blended, you can call them blended, wrecked, um, a mess, crashed, I don't know what they are, but we both came from those kinds of families, and Jesus never leveraged his power. In fact, he said, I come to lay down my life. Parents, I realize your kids might not get that concept, but as parents, we can. To lay down our lives, sometimes we have to defer our wants, our wishes, our dreams, our goals and desires for a little time because we've got children to raise. We're going to talk more about that as we keep going. Because when it becomes about the individual and the family, now you've got a dysfunctional family. When it becomes about the individual and not the family, you've got a dysfunctional family. Now you've got the alcoholic. Now you've got the addict. Now you've got the abuser or the absent parent. And so he says, we need to lay down our lives. Just defer to that. Um, on the outside, we, we can look like everything's good, but on the inside of the home, nobody knows what goes on in that place. And so what if, what if, what if as a parent, we tried this principle? What if instead of powering up as a parent, we just powered down, making that sacrifice for our family? Now, in the family again, it's not about what's best for you. It's about what's best for the family. And now, later on in this chapter, as Paul writes this letter, he's going to give us some very specific examples. And we're going to go through some of these, some you're familiar with. And I'm going to do my best to explain to you because any of these scriptures, if we take them out of context, we can really, really misapply them. Now, I'm going to read to you, the next verse I'm going to read to you is probably the only Bible verse and probably the first Bible verse that men ever memorize. And before I even read it, men in here already know what verse I'm going to read. So drop down further on the page, go to verse number 22. Here's some specific examples of how we can imitate Christ in our home. Verse number 22, for wives, I want all just the ladies in the church, say the second word up there with me. Say it with me, for what? Okay, let's get more women involved, all right? For Thank you, ladies. Men, did you hear that? Men, just get your phone out right now. Just pick up your phone and just like zone out for a few moments because I'm not even going to talk to you, all right? So you can just update your Facebook status, go on Instagram, whatever you do. I'm just going to talk to the ladies for a couple of minutes, all right? Now, this, this is, this is ladies, ladies, this verse does not mean, this verse does not mean that Bubba can go home and lay on the couch this afternoon, 
grunt and scratch and tell you to get some more chips while he's watching the game, all right? That's not what this is all about. And you go, yes, dear, yes, dear. Okay, anything else? Do you want your slippers? I mean, can I get it? Are you comfortable and fluff the pillow? No, 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 no. That's not what this means at all, okay? Now, you have to understand the context that Paul writes this verse is in a Christian, in a Christian home. Understand the context of this. Now, I'm going to go all the way back to the, the time, the culture that Paul writes to. You had Jews back in the time, you had Greeks, and you had Romans. And you would have had Jews, Greeks, and Romans in the church, in the city of Ephesus, when Paul writes this letter. Now, divorce was absolutely at critical mass in the culture that Paul writes to. You think that 50%, the divorce rate, roughly 50% in our culture today, it was so much higher then that marriage was at a crisis situation in the culture to which Paul writes. For instance, to the Jew, to the Jew, they could divorce for any reason at all. You know what? She made that pot roast again, and I hate the way she makes that pot roast. And he could literally write her a certificate of divorce, hand it to her, kick her out the door. That's how easy it was in the Jewish culture. For any and all reasons, he could divorce his wife, and so they did. To the Greeks, to the Greeks, the only reason that you married a woman was to have children. A wife was for children, women in general were for fun. So you can about imagine in the Greek culture, where the city of Ephesus was located, how marriage was viewed. And then to the Roman culture, the Roman culture, men and women alike measured time in the number of spouses they had. I'm serious. They would go through so many husbands and throw them so many wives that they would measure time based upon the number of spouses they'd been married to. And so Paul is pulling back and he's saying, let's elevate, let's elevate the value of marriage for a moment. Ladies, Would you stay dedicated and devoted to this man as if you were being dedicated and devoted to Jesus? Would you just do that? Let's elevate. Let's give importance and value once again to the marriage. This does not mean, ladies, if your husband is an abuser, physically, emotionally, or sexually, just be the doormat and take it. That is not what this verse means. If we apply it that way, we're totally missing the point. God would never want you to go through that abusive situation, ladies. There are such a thing as called boundaries. It's called dignity and value and self-respect, and you deserve all of that this morning. He just wants to give value to the marriage. In understanding, he's saying, look, submission here is voluntary. It's not mandatory. And it's so easy to do when you really love the person to whom you're married. And you know what? You did this when you were dating. You submitted to this guy all the time. You remember, do you remember the stupid, ridiculous arguments you had when you were dating? What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Well, I don't know. I asked you first. What do you want to do? Well, I want to go out and eat. <gasps> okay. Well, where do you want to go eat? I don't care. Where do you want to go eat? Remember those stupid fights? And you were just in love. You didn't care. You just did all of that stuff. Now, now, now. Men, men, if you ever use that verse... There's going to be a whole lot less submission in your house. Just saying, all right? Okay, so now let's talk to the men for just a little bit. Let's drop down to verse number 25. For husbands, come on, husbands, say this with me, for? Let's represent men a little better here, okay? Say it with me. For husbands, oh, I love it. Ooh, got some testosterone in the room. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And then if you don't know how that is, he puts that statement in there. He says, he gave himself up for her. It's chivalry. It's romantic. In fact, he says in verse 28, in the same way, you know, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. Now, this word love, there's so many different definitions of love. This is the kind of agape love. This is the sacrificial love. This is the love that says, babe, I will do anything for you. I'll climb the highest mountain for you. I'll swim the deepest ocean for you. I'll do anything for you because I am absolutely devoted and dedicated to you. And so he says, husbands, would you just love your wives like that? Because it's like loving your own body. Come on, come on, come on. Men, if you loved your wife like you love your truck, you'd have a great marriage, right? So love your wife like you love your truck. And men, you all know how to love your body because you're going to leave this place today. There's going to be a football game on this afternoon, and you're going to love your body. You're going to get as comfortable as you possibly can, and you're going to shove the chips down your throat, just loving your body, right? 
And if you would give that kind of devotion, if you give the same attention to your wife or to the woman in your life as you do to the game controller, <gasps> pastor, don't say that. I'm just telling you, it would just revolutionize your relationship. Because look what he says in the rest of verse number 20. For a man who loves his wife actually shows that he loves himself. Now, I'm going to translate that because this was written in Greek, and I'm going to translate that statement right there into English, into our modern-day English, so we can understand where he says, for a man who loves his wife actually loves himself. Here's what Paul is saying. Make mama happy, because if mama ain't happy, you ain't going to be happy, right? That's really what he's saying there. Just give yourself for her. You had no problem doing it when you were dating, so keep doing it after you're married. I'll just tell you, if you just love a little woman like that, it would be so beneficial in the marriage. And then Paul writes to really a culture where women had no value. They were just a piece of property. And he says, let's, let's elevate the status of women. In fact, the Bible did more to elevate the status of women than any other document published. Now, men, just lay down your power, lay down your life for the love of of your wife. That's really what he's saying. And ladies, can I just say this? If, if your husband starts doing that kind of stuff, don't put your hands on your hips and go, well, it's about time. Because that'll be the last time, all right? <laughs> you just reward that however you want to reward that. Because what gets rewarded gets repeated. Just saying, you know? Us men, we think we're in charge of the house. We're not in charge. It's just that our wives know what to reward, and it just happens over and over again. So, all right? Understand this. You invest in your spouse because your spouse, that's the most important relationship in the household. It's not more important than the relationship with your children. You understand that your children are not, they're just your children are the outcome of your relationship, not the subject of the relationship. You have children because two people fell in love. You don't have two children to stay in love. So now let's talk to children in here. All right. Children, I'm going to see how many children are in here. All right, let's go children. If you are 18 and under, we're going to go to the next chapter now. I'm going to talk to you for just a little bit. Uh, this, is just for, this is information for you children here, okay? This is not for your parents. Parents, if you're in here, just don't pay attention to this. I'm just going to talk to your kids for a few moments. So in, in Ephesians 6, 1, now we get to Ephesians 6, 1. Look at that first word. So all the kids say that first word with me. Say children with me. Ready? One, two, three. Let me talk to your parents then. All right. <laughs> Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is just the right thing to do. <laughs> I know kids are in here going, yeah, but pastor, if you knew my parents, like, did you see what they wore to church this morning? You want me to obey their, like, they can't even put, they can't even, they can't, like, look, at the, look what they're wearing, and you want me to listen to that, you know, that whole kind of thing. But, but, but just understand this. We obey parents. This is just, this is logical. Now, this isn't just for the kids that are here. Because if you're here today, somewhere along the line, you had a parent in your life. Or you had a figure of a parent in your life. And the reason that we obey our parents is this. Because our parents have been there and they've done that. And they probably did it wrong. And they suffered the consequences. And they felt the guilt. And they dealt with the punishment. And now they're raising you, and they want to do everything they possibly can to help you avoid the same catastrophe. And they're just looking out for you. It would be cruel, it would be cruel if parents never taught their children what they themselves learned. If you ever put your hand on the burner of a stove and burned your hand, it would be cruel of you as a parent to watch your child reach up and do the same thing and not give them the warning. That's just abusive. We would never do that kind of thing. So we just listen to mom and dad. Mom and dad, can I encourage you? Here's the teacher part of me. Would you just, would you be the parent to your children and not their friend? They don't need a friend. Friends are at school. They need parents at home because when you're a parent at home, when you're a parent at home, you now lend them security and stability in the home and they need to know that you're a parent. Understand this, that if our culture is disintegrating, if any of you feel like the culture around you is just absolutely imploding and disintegrating, it started in the home. Let's be parents in the home first. All right, dads, let's talk to you for just a little bit. If I've not offended you yet, I still got a couple more pages of notes, all right? Let's go to chapter 6, verse number 4. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. 
Here's what I would say to that. Mom and dad, mom and dad, understand this. You are raising your children to leave a legacy behind you. Your parenting today, your parenting today is gonna have an effect on culture and the world around you a 100 years from now. Mom and dad, I'm telling you, don't push your children. Don't push your children. Don't push your children. You lead your children. You lead your children to the legacy. You lead your children to the destination. You want to get them to stop pushing them towards the dreams that were never fulfilled in your life. Lead them to the destiny you want them to get to. Your children are watching you. It's kind of creepy. They're watching you. They're just, it's just, I'm just telling you, they're watching you. And I still hear things out of the mouth of my son that freak me out. Things that he noticed that I just never intended for him to see. In fact, Dr. Dobson said it this way. He said, the footsteps a child follows are most likely to be the ones his parents thought that he covered up. That's a little scary, isn't it? But your children, they pick up on your attitudes. If your children are using words and language that, that you don't want them to use, well, stop using it yourself. We told our son at the supper table one night, we said, it's okay for you to use all the same words that we use. If we don't use that word, you don't use that word. Are you with me, parents? All right. That's just a practical thing. Look, your job, your job as a parent is to raise your children to be independent of you, but dependent on Jesus. Cut the apron strings. You know what? It's just wrong. It's just wrong. Come on. Some parents, they just can't let go. They can't let go. And parenting, parenting, the most painful thing about parenting is this. It is continually a process of letting go, and every time you let go, it's a painful moment. It's fun. They're just in these little cooey stages in the diapers. New, they need you, and you hold them all, that kind of thing. And then they start to crawl, and it opens a whole new world. It just freaks you out. No! Now they can get into the cupboards, and then they start walking. And the fastest land animal on earth is a parent following a toddler who just learned to walk. You know, have you, have you, it's just amazing how fast they go. And then as they get older, the first time they ride their bike, the first time they go to school, I remember standing in the back of the room when our, our son started kindergarten. Robin and I are standing in the back. First day of kindergarten, all the parents are back here. I mean, it's like, it's kindergarten, you know? And the teacher's standing up front saying, you parents can go now. You know, oh, we're walking out of the room. It's all about letting go. And then they graduate high school, and you drive them off to their college. You let go of them again. And then they walk down the aisle, and some jerk marries this gorgeous daughters of yours. You got to let go again. It's just always about letting go. Because think about this, mom and dad, mom and dad, you don't want your kids living with you when they're 40. And I know that's true. Because you don't want to be living with your parents. Oh, I just know that stuff. Mom and dad, tell your kids that you love them and you're proud of them so much that they're sick of it. But they believe it. And then, before, before Paul wrote any of this stuff about wives submitting and husbands loving and children obeying and all that whole kind of stuff, before he wrote any of that stuff in specifics, look what he said in verse number 21. Verse 21, look at the screen. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's not about submitting to authority. This is just about submitting to each other in the home. You say, well, pastor, what, what does that look like in a home? Let me, let me just tell you what, what that verse looks like in a home right there. Men, you get home from work and your wife is dealing with the household, managerial, whatever it is that she's doing there, and there's screaming kids, running kids, wild kids, no kids. I don't care what the home environment is like. Men, you come into the home, and you go to your wife. Don't, don't just touch stuff. Just leave her alone for a little bit, all right? Because the moment you start to touch her, she's going to think, oh, great, now what? Okay, so just sit down somewhere and say this. Just say, hey, babe. Anything I can do for you? <laughs> Babe, wake up, wake up, wake up, <laughs> wake up, wake up. No, seriously, is there anything that I can do for you? And the moment you do that, you know what you've done? You have affirmed her. You've just given her value. You just said, you know what? You're willing to step into my world and be a part of it. I feel so valued by you right now. Thank you. Now, just be prepared for what she might say if you ask the question, all right? If you don't plan to follow through, don't ask the question. Okay, ladies, you know what this looks like for you? Here's what it looks like. Your man gets relaxed after supper, after meal. And you just look lovingly into his eyes and you say, uh, 
Hey, hey sugar booger. <laughs> Is there anything I can do for you? You know what? Men feel like your world is so separate from their world. They feel like their world is so separate from your world. And when you ask the question, is there something that I can do for you, suddenly you've said to them, you want to be in my world? I need a friend. I'm lonely. I would love somebody to talk to. And sometimes you don't even have to talk. In fact, if you talk, you might make it worse. But you know what your man would love you to do? I just love this. This this last summer, I love a clean vehicle, and I'm outside this summer washing our car in the driveway. My wife, my wife, and I, and, and I just told her how valuable this was. She brought her little lawn chair out there, and she sat it in the driveway, and she brought her book, and she put her feet up on the stool that I used to get up on top to wash the vehicle, and she kept me company. Suddenly, my wife got into my world, and I felt like a rock star. Ladies, it's that simple. He'd sit out in the garage when he's working on the car. What's that doohickey thingy right there? Bolty thing, a jig or whatever. I, you know, just get into his world. He just feels so valuable. Students, you know what this looks like for you? Students, I'm going to tell you how to rock your parents' world. We're going to be done in just a moment. Students, you know how to do this? You wait until mom and dad have company over to the house. Come on, students, come on. You wait until mom and dad have company. And they come over to the house and company's there. And you just wait for the opportune moment. And then you walk into the room. And you look at your parents and say, Mom, Dad, is there anything that I can do for you around the house? <laughs> like, seriously, Mom, Dad, like, is there anything? Now, here's what's going to happen. You, you ask that question in front of their friends. You've just made them feel like parents of the year, and their friends are going to be going, how did you do that? Like, what books are you reading? We... With the, like, and you're just going to look like a rock star to your family. It's just going to be an amazing event. That's all you got to do, kids. But then again, be willing to do whatever mom and dad ask you. Yeah, and mom and dad, don't provoke your children. To, yeah, go do the dishes, sweep the driveway, clean the garage, clean the bay. No, like, don't do that kind of stuff, okay? Here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. In the family, it's all about the family, not the individual. And Jesus set the bar. Jesus set the bar. Jesus, God's Son, leaves the comforts and the glory of heaven. And he steps onto this dirty, pitiful, sin stained world. And he experiences all the things that we experience in life. And he lives on this world to suffer everything that we suffer. And never once did Jesus leverage his power to get people to serve him. But he offered himself to serve us. And then he dies a criminal's death on a cross, crucified. And he bore the consequences of all our sins. Which brings me to the last verse I'm going to share with you. Look at this. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, you probably have this memorized. God showed, he demonstrated, he proved his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. You know what I love about that? I'm just going to end here because we're, we're going we're to do something in the church we call communion. And I think, I think the most valuable way that we can express, show, and demonstrate love in our family is to offer forgiveness before it's asked for. And that's exactly what God did for us. We didn't know that we needed to be, we didn't know that we offended Him. We didn't know that we offended Him. And yet long before we came to the realization that we offended Him, that we weren't the greatest family member, He moved towards us with His Son, Jesus. Every great family is made up of family members who are forgivers. And maybe today, maybe there's a parent you need to forgive. You're grown, your parents are deceased, you got to forgive them. Maybe there's a sibling and you felt cheated, betrayed, I don't know what it was, you got to forgive them. Because it's not about you and it's not about them. It's about the family.